Hello and welcome back to the Villa Filler podcast. I'm here as always with my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, Tottenham Hotspur 1, Aston Villa 2. How you doing, mate? Oh, need you say any more, mate? It, that, that question feels a little bit futile after that introduction, doesn't it? It really does, my friend. It really does. Now, again, we're here. We're back with the Villa Filler. It is the penultimate regular season podcast and Villa have managed to win their final away game of the Premier League season and you know winning their first away game of the season as well which was the first uh, against Fulham you know very cyclical of Villa to do this it's quite symbolic uh, managing to get this win on the road now Dan obviously um, coming into this game as, as you rightfully highlighted there's just a plethora of attacking talent from Tottenham Hotspur right there are so so many players and the fact that they could even bring on the likes of Gareth Bale and Tangi and Dombele off the bench in this game just speaks volumes about Villa's squad. Now, an interesting thing before the game, obviously, when the lineups come out, and, you know, you're due for the annual hourly before kickoff uh, aneurysm from Villa fans on Twitter with the lineup. Esri Concert at right back, I think it went a bit unnoticed, but during last season and during Project Restart, Esri to be fair, looked very solid at right back as well, although you could clearly see he was too good to be playing there. Uh, and we all know how it's been so far this season. It, he, he's been remarkable. He's probably arguably been the player of the season. Uh, I'll leave that for you guys to debate in the comments. How did you feel when you saw this lineup, Dan? Because I know you weren't necessarily feeling as confident. I don't think anyone was, to be honest. It's been, you know, rightfully so after the three months Villa have had. Coming into this game, you see the lineup, Dan. You see the Spurs lineup. You see Harry Kane. You see King Min Son. You see Bergvain. You can't help but worry before coming into this game, can you? Yeah, I, I well, that that's the first thing that you know. I touched on in my preview is just that you know you have to be so wary of not just the players that Spurs have, but as you say, mate, the players that they leave on the bench. You know, if you, if you look at the likes of, they obviously bring on Gareth Bale, Tangu and Bele. They didn't touch Lucas Moura, didn't touch Giovanni Lo Celso, even down to the likes of Eric Lamella, um, who's, who's a player that in his own right is, you know, exceptional in some games. Um, there's just so many different ways that they can line up that front line. And I think that's why we saw Esri, because bless him, Elmo, coming up against Xiong Min San on that left-hand side. And, you know, I, I'm talking about this man, pre-game and the worries that you have about Sergio Reguilón bombing on down the left-hand side. I mean, before he went, well, I'm sure we'll come on to discuss. Um, he's a threat, like when he gets going and he's in full cry, overlapping son. And for poor old Ezri, uh, Elmo, I think that's a, that's a lot. And so I think Ezri was just brought in for his defensive now. And obviously it's a position he's not dis familiar with. You know, he's, he's played it at times last season. But to be honest with you, mate, if I'm being completely honest, um, as soon as the lineups came out, there was only really one name and I, I was attracted to, to be honest with you, everything else uh, sort of phased into insignificance. Um, it was so good to see our captain back out there, wasn't it, mate? It really was. And again, I, you know, I, kind of, I tweeted this before the game. I feel like the last time Villa actually looked uh, threatening uh, over a consistent basis over, you know, a number of games actually was when, you know, you had Anwar playing on the left, you had Bertie playing on the right, and you had Jack in the middle. And that was the case today. Jack managed to get 70 minutes, which is, of course, absolutely massive. And it was never going to be any more. It was never going to be any less. And Villa just looks so much of a better side with Jack Grealish in the side. It's remarkable. The confidence that this man gives the rest of the team is just... It, it can't go without, you know, without being mentioned because... We're looking at players that, you know, we talk about how much of a confidence player Ogazi is and we talk about how sort of inconsistent Traore is, who's actually awarded the who scored man of the match today. Um, and just even, you know, the tackles from McGinn and, and, and how players like Matt Target conduct themselves when Jack Grealish is in the side. He just, it, it's almost like being on the pitch. He just commands levels of performances that the players just aren't capable of without him, which is... Actually, it, I mean, it's mental to think because, you know, you see Villa play like this and it is actually, you know, somewhat frustrating, really, the past three months. Of course, we can put it down to COVID. We can put it down to, to the lack of, uh, of, of, of a certain captain not being in the side. But I mean, to be honest, Dan, you know, I want to touch on Ezri, as I mentioned at the top, because he was fantastic today, really nullified the threat of Son, uh, you know, made one tackle, one interception, three clearances. 
um, only gave away one foul during the game. And Hyung Min Son is and has been uh, a bit of a thorn in Villa's side every time we played them, Dan, haven't we? It seemed like Bjorn Engels gave him a broken arm and he still had to score against us when we played against Tottenham at Villa Park last season. Um, so shout out to Ezri tonight. I think for me as well, a really important facet to this game, Dan, and again, I, I do believe you did touch on this in your preview, was actually marvellous Lacamba. And again, Villa for the podcast, no slander for players, uh, especially Douglas Louise. But having a naturally defensive-minded number six come into the side, bar the goal, which he you know, was obviously responsible for giving away so early on. Marvellous Nakamba was wonderful. You know, he made three tackles, two interceptions, a clearance, really swept up very well at the base of that midfield. And you know, we've asked questions about Douglas Louise as to whether he can be a sole six. I think Marvellous has kind of answered that kind of for us tonight. He, he was really good and, you know, I don't think you can turn your nose up at a midfield that consists of Deli Ali, San, uh, you know, in, in the year 2021. Deli Ali is a good player within his own right. Uh, Son, again, you know, Ezri has done an absolute number on him, which is, is really good to see. And, and, and Bergvine as well, of course, gets the goal, um, which I think we should probably talk about first. And uh, clearly there wasn't a man on shout. I don't know whether the sound of the players maybe drowned it out because you may usually hear that kind of thing on the telly with no fans in. Uh, and, you know, it's a wonderful technique. He does really well, does kind of ride his luck a bit with some of the bounces. But, you know, he is kind, he's created that chance for himself. He's hunted down Marv, uh, flicked the ball up, and it's a wonderful finish past Emi Martinez. But, you know, 14 a- minutes into the game, Dan, Villa have gone 1-0 down. It's usually doom and gloom at this point. It's but a great it goal, mate. You know, I think that's that's a thing we have to recognise. That it's, it's it's a really good goal, and I know that we. I'm not. I don't. That's the first mistake I recall Marvellous Nakamba making this season. High profile, anyway. And I like we went through a period where we didn't concede with him on the pitch for know, about seven or eight games or something like that. The amount of minutes that he was racking up, where Villa hadn't yet conceded when he was on the pitch, was was quite something. And I think. We've seen such a progression in Marvellous Nakamba that he's been out for so many games now that I think that, you know, it, I think he's he makes a little meal of it. I don't think, the, in fairness to him, you know, and, I, and I'm not trying to make excuses for anyone, mate, I don't think the pass into him is great. Mm. Um, it, it's sort of fizzed in at him. It's bouncing. It's not very comfortable. And look, you know, I'm not. I'm not saying he shouldn't have done better or anything like that. I'm just saying I, I don't think the pass particularly helped the situation. But Bergwijn's got it all to do, and you know, he, he scores scores a great goal. And is, you know, when regardless of what happened before, when you see the ball go in like that and it crashes in off the underside of the bar, and, and you, you, there is a sort of part that goes, well, fair play. I mean, if you're going to concede them, you know, at least make sure you're conceding goals like that. Um, and so, yeah, I think at that point you you do rightly have to question the resilience. Sorry, like compliment the resilience that the boys showed, mate, um, to to get themselves back into it. And marvelous Nakamba, even more so because I mean he has officially been accredited with the assist, which I think is slightly fortunate. But I think it means he made an uh, made amends um, because he's put. It's a great finish by Reggion. I mean, he doesn't mean it at all. Um, and not only is it like an absolute calamity, but it's also the 1,000th own goal in Premier League history. Little factoid for you there. Want to remember that, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was the 1,000th own goal in Premier League history, 10,483 days after the first. Um, so he's really marked that milestone. And I think you have to credit such a regular on there because, uh, yeah, he's made sure that not only will it be remembered for being this, the 1,000th own goal, one to remember because it's probably one of the best in Premier League history as well. It really is. And Jamie Redknapp had the audacity at half time to tell him that Larice should have anticipated it. I'm thinking, nah, that's that's wonderful. And as well, after that ball went into that top right corner, it's almost as if it switched for Villa. Like we have to, we have to aim for this part of the goal. He ain't getting it. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, we saw John McGinn, Amaro Ghazi, Bertrand Traore all have efforts, uh, you know, on that specific area on the goal. And it feels like, Dan, for the first time, you know, we've, it, it, it was worrying seeing Villa go one and down, especially in recent games. You know, we've actually been playing OK, managed to take the lead against Palace, didn't obviously work out there. We've dropped 16 points since March from winning positions. 
Um, and when Villa eventually do get in, ahead in this game, which of course we're going to, uh, it almost seemed, you know, that that kind of that, that that doubt, that feeling, Villa are going to capitulate at some point. It really did start to set in, uh, despite Tottenham looking utterly useless. Now, you know, here at the Villa Villa, we do like to provide, uh, you know, in depth analysis. I don't really know what to say about Tottenham tonight, Dan, because they just look blunted every time they went forward. And, you know, of course there's, you know, there's that doubt, which I've literally just referenced every time they carried the ball forward, but there was no genuine threat on the goal from, from, from Tottenham apart from their first goal. There was, there was none of that throughout the whole game. And, you know, the only thing you would potentially worry about is the fact that Villa have dropped so many points in this second half of the season and not Tottenham getting back into this game because they deserved it. Because even though for large portions of this game, it was very end to end, in terms of you know serious goal mouth action, it was very one sided. But had twenty attempts against Tottenham Hotspur. Dan, we only have to go back a month to see how utterly useless Villa were against Spurs at home, don't we? Yeah, exactly. And it, Spurs are. Um, I think you can't really underestimate how difficult it is sometimes to leave what's happening off the pitch when you go onto the pitch and still perform. But there's such a dark cloud hanging over Spurs at the moment. You know, if it extends from the Super League, you've obviously got all the the storm that's surrounding Harry Kane at the moment. You've got you know Daniel Levy today coming out and making further comments. I mean, I believe you know, and I do feel for the Spurs fans that were there tonight because the tickets were sixty pounds to go and see that yeah. game, um, which that's is you know that's the most any Premier League club is charging for those tickets. Um, you know, Daniel Levy came out today and said that Spurs have lost track of what's in their DNA. Um, your chairman's coming out and saying that you've got Ryan Mason. You don't know whether he's in, whether he's out. You've got your your star, not just your star player, your captain, the the, the face of the club, the the only shining light in the whole system at the moment. In Harry Kane, currently em- embroiled in a willy won't he sort of thing, where no one really knows whether he's asked to leave or not. He went and did a solo lap of honor at the end as well, which won't have done the situation any good whatsoever. And it's difficult. We know this, mate, when the environment of the club isn't right, when there's a certain feeling and a certain mood off the pitch and there's things hanging over the club that it really does affect, you know, players aren't robots, they're human beings, they're aware of the situations and it's sometimes very difficult to block all that out and go and focus on the job at hand and, you know, Leeds got the better of them the other week and we've done it here and I think it was a really poor Spurs performance, but it's a really poor state that the club is in. And I, I don't think that the two are two separate entities. I think you have to consider them as a whole and say that one influences the other. And I think it certainly did tonight, mate. Definitely. And, you know, talking about positive influences, Jack Grealish, four key passes tonight. He made 46 passes in total with an 89.1% pass accuracy, two crosses, two long balls, uh, one of which was accurate. It was just so good to see Jack on the pitch. Now, obviously, when we kind of saw him get introduced against Everton, it was almost like watching Bambi on ice. It was, you know, he'd, he'd taken that mantle off Keenan Davis, actually. Um, you know, it, he looked very raw. He looked as if he'd maybe never played football before, but actually, you know, has these bags of ability because he was just slipping and sliding all over the place. Uh, we saw, obviously, a bit more of him against Crystal Palace in, in the sort of fleeting minutes that he got towards the end of the game. Tonight, it really felt like Jack Grealish was back. And, you know, he was running the show. Villa looked so good with him in the side. And, you know, it's, it's just a sight to behold. You sometimes, despite us constantly banging his, his drum down, you know, for, for months and months on end and saying it's scandalous how people haven't got him in, in their Premier League team of the seasons or how he's not included in people's 26-man England squads, you know, even despite the injury. You Sometimes you genuinely just do forget how good a player is. And Jack Grealish is, is just wonderful. And... You know, Dan and I are very envious of the 10,000 of you that will get to watch him play in Villa's final game against Chelsea. But Dan, another player who is just, again, wonderful. And, you know, a player who um, I think we actually, we, we've, again, underappreciated. You only realise what you don't have when it's not there. And it's easy to say that, you know, obviously we had Keenan up front a few games ago and now we're back. Ollie Watkins is back in the side. And him and Bertrand Traore create this second goal from nothing. And, you know, Sergio Reguilón obviously wasn't having the best of game, giving away their own goals. And what's really important for me is, is how Traore actually acted off the ball, more specifically in the first half, because I think the second half, he was neither here nor there. Um, but, you know, 
he got the instructions to press onto Regulon and he was relentless. He didn't give up on that. They managed to win possession back after a few deflections and Ollie Watkins scores a wonderful goal. It, it really isn't, you know, he's denied probably two penalties as well before this, Dan, earlier in the game, um, which is frustrating. But, you know, 16 goals in all competitions now for Ollie Watkins, uh, for Aston Villa in his debut season in the top flight. It's, it's just crazy, man. And, you know, I know we're talking about recruitment. I know we're talking about signing players. Trust me, you're going to see a lot of transfer room or podcasts in the coming months. It, it almost feels redundant signing another striker because... Ollie Watkins is he he's he's the best centre forward we've had at the club, you know. For I think we're we're talking you know ten years maybe Dan. Yeah, it's it's crazy the impact this guy has had on the side. Oh, for sure, mate, for sure. And you know he's now the top. I don't think any English player has scored more for Villa in a single season in the Premier League era than than Ollie Watkins has now with with fourteen. And you look at some of the players that he's now scored more goals than this season. I mean, you know, you've got people lauding the seasons that Ilkay Gundogan has had. You know, Kalechi Iheanacho, Edinson Cavani, Raheem Sterling, Marcus Rashford, Danny Ings, Abamyang, Vardy. The list goes on and on and on. Ollie Watkins has got more than all, all of those players I just mentioned. And it's his first season in the league. And when you look at how he's settled in and embedded himself in the squad, it feels like he's he's been here forever. Um, and you, because of the work that he puts in, um, you feel like every goal is is earned and deserved. And you're really rooting for him to take every chance away because you're aware of how much he deserves it. And But, you know, I think credit has to go to Bertrand as you rightly said, mate, for that goal, because for a player that can't defend, that's remarkably good pressing to go and make sure that he blocks that and, and wins it, you know, but remember, he, he can't defend that and this is, this is the role. Narrative, the narrative, mate. It, um, but no, no, it's, it's, it was really good, mate. Really good. It's exactly what you want to see because against those top sides, it can sometimes be hard to fashion chances of your own and so capitalising on their, your opposition's mistakes is important whenever they come up and I feel like Realistically, Spurs only did that a few times tonight, and yeah. we managed to make the most of it and get the lead. And, and you know that, that's all that matters. Definitely, and listen again. Another massive, massive uh, bonus to come out of this game, Dan, is the, albeit limited minutes that Carney Triplemaker and Jaden Philogene Bades got from this. I think it's another. It's oh, the overwhelming pride that I'm feeling, Dan. That you're feeling that, that the Villa fans across. Uh, you know, the, the country are feeling to see these lads actually play is remarkable because we're living in a time, Dan, where young players are, you know, they're, they're feeling encouraged, they're feeling empowered to go and, you know, be knocking on the manager's door and going, I should be playing, I'm the best thing since sliced bread, uh, you know, and then you see them going abroad, you see the likes of Sancho, you see the likes of Bellingham, and, and how, you know, important it is for young players to be getting minutes in the right environment. It's important to preface that. Um, and, you know, for Carney to come on and get seven minutes, for, for Jaden to come on and get about five as well, is remarkable. Carney, 100% pass accuracy, only made three, albeit. But he's a player, he, he was looking to constantly bring Villa forward at any opportunity that he had. Very confident on the ball. For anyone who hasn't seen Carney before, I mean, he's taken to he's taken to the Premier League in the short space of time like a duck to water. It was a seamless transition from how he's been playing for the under 18s, for the under 23s. And to see, see him have the audacity to take on a shot from outside the box against a goalkeeper who's won the fucking World Cup and come so close down and hit the post. I could have cried. I could cry now describing it. It was wonderful. You don't see that kind of swagger and, and you know, just self-confidence from young players. Even in, in, you know, a young Jack Grealish or, you know, a young Callum Robinson, you can kind of see the sort of self-doubt that kind of looms over the players that may be thinking, am I good enough? Have I earned this? You don't see that with Khan. Like, he's just come on and he's turned it on like it's nothing. There's a massive future ahead for this lad. And Jaden as well. It was great to see him on. There was a little bit of link up between the two lads. I mean, Jaden had a chance to get across into the box as well, which was was great. Carney obviously coming close with the shot. And it's great to see the rewards 
uh, of, of really good recruitment actually paying off because I think Carney, Carney actually would have came in around the time, um, uh, you know, the new ownership. So he's very much a new signing. But I think with a lot of the players, Dan, that we have been lauding from the academy, the likes of Kessler, the likes of Jaden, the, the likes of Rahiki, players like that, they've actually been in the system longer than, you know, your Carnies and your Barrys, which is important to preface because uh, a lot of praise rightly so has has gone on to the likes of uh of the owners for investing in the youth but obviously you know the system that you know they inherited wasn't all bad you know we're seeing good players come out of them they just never really got these kind of opportunities before and i think they're unlucky in the fact that the youth cup final is obviously being played immediately after the chelsea game the next day because you can't help but feel tonight kane kessler probably plays if there's more time for recovery can't help but feel like, you know, maybe uh, Louis Barry makes the bench. Obviously, Keelan Van Nistelrooy didn't travel with the squad today. But, I mean, the future is so bright, Dan, and it's really good to see, uh, you know, these lads, they've been promised minutes. There's been reports saying, you know, interest from Italy and Germany, you know, specifically for Carney. Carney's on a pro contract. He's going nowhere. They, they, can't, they can't take him out. They can't, you can't buy him out of a contract. He's not on a scholar's apprenticeship contract. He is a professional footballer for Aston Villa. He is on a first team contract. So Carney isn't going anywhere. They've clearly been promised that they'd be involved in the squad. They've had a taste for it. Dean's given them little bits as and when he can, obviously, because the Youth Cup's important as well. We can't underplay the importance of that. You know, a lot of people were expecting Carney to start today, which is just ludicrous because you can't have your best midfielder get injured before a cup final. That's, that's just stupid, guys. Come on. Like, <laughs> let's, let's be real. Um, but, you know, they've clearly been promised if they're good enough, if, you know, if they behave, all these kind of things, that opportunities will come their way. And it's great to see them get that and, and really take it by the scuff of the neck, Dan. And you can't help but feel pre-season is going to be massive for these lads. Yeah, absolutely, mate. I mean, I think there's there's two things which I sort of noticed about this this happening. And, you know, when you put the obvious delight aside, as, as you rightly touched on, mate, you made a very good point in that you have to credit the previous regime that got very little credit. You know, Mark Harrison's come in and he's done a fantastic job, but a lot of the lads that you're seeing come through, and yes, he has brought the likes of Barry and, and Carney into the setup, as you rightly said, but, you know, you, the vast majority of players that are coming through the ranks were players nurtured by the likes of Brian Jones, Gordon Cowers, you know, Tony McAndrew, Sean Verity, Stuart Taylor, those kind of... Yeah, ben Petty, I think it was Ben Petty. That previous regime... Suso bought in Mark Harrison with yeah. Christian Perslow. So there's so much of the previous regime that didn't get very much credit that have really laid the groundwork for this to be so much of a success. And I think just because they're not here, just because they're not around doesn't mean they don't deserve a huge amount of the credit because we wouldn't have this flourishing young crop of players if it wasn't for those guys. Um, and I think that leads me nicely on to my second point is that Carney's now the third youngest player to ever represent Villa in the Premier League. The youngest is Gareth Barry, who represented Villa. He was literally just 17. I think it was like 17 in 30 days or something like that. The next youngest is Russian Hepburn Murphy, who's a player that we ultimately, I believe, as Villa failed because we didn't yeah. give him the opportunities. It felt like Russian Hepburn Murphy was playing youth football and under-23s and reserve football for years. And and now you know he's he's found a home out in is it Cyprus. He's playing in Cyprus. Yeah, I think he's playing for Pathos. And I, I wish him all the best. But Villa never gave him that opportunity. You know, Villa sort of stored that career. You don't develop playing youth football. And so I feel with Carney, and you've got all those clubs sniffing around and mate, all those serious European powerhouses that are looking at the kid, giving him that path to the first team and saying, "Look, it's there for you. You're there." You haven't got to go and leave to get in these minutes. You haven't got to go to Germany like so many of the young English players have to get that first team football. It's right here for you. And I think that was important to give him that time before the season was done because the last thing you want to do is have him his head turned by the promise of minutes when you haven't given him any. And so just giving him that little taste of the first team, hopefully we get to see it um, again next season. Obviously, we probably won't see him feature against Chelsea at the weekend because of the cup final that's, I believe, the day after. Um, but no, really good to see, mate. And as you rightly said, if that goal had gone in, that would have been brilliant. But uh, yeah, a real nice cherry on the icing of the cake, I think they call it. It is. And, and as well, you know, obviously, you know, they're, they're thought highly of. They're both very talented footballers. I feel like we've maybe forgotten a bit about Philogene Badeus. He's one that was kind of spoken about a lot 
sort of last season. He's not really um, had as, you know, he's not garnered as much noise as the likes of Chuck Wilmaker and, and Barry. Uh, you know, even someone like Brad Young as well doesn't get enough credit for his role in, in, in the youth side. Because um, there's, there's just so many fantastic players in this side, but it really is taking the piss, isn't it? You know, bringing you <laughs> two young lads on when you're 2-1 up against Tottenham. Uh, of course, Dean has full faith in them. I don't think it was uh, an intentional uh, diss on Tottenham, but for them, you know, you're, you're down bad when these lads are coming on and getting shots on goal and, uh, and, and you know, drifting past players. It's Honestly, it's wonderful. And, you know, it, it feels like a performance like this has been long overdue, Dan. And, you know, it's been... God, it's, it's been a long sort of three, four months without Jack Grealish, hasn't it? Only four wins, uh, I think, without him, which is just remarkable uh, that, you know, that we're at this point now. But hopefully these minutes in the tank will be vital for the Euros, which are coming, I think, Dan, in, in just under a month now, which is absolutely crazy to think. But, you know, we have one more final game, Dan, against Chelsea. There will be a preview podcast, uh, uh, five things that Aston Villa can do to beat Chelsea. Uh, coming out within the next few days for you guys. Again, just like to reiterate, uh, really happy for everybody who's going to this game. Honestly, as you know, I've I can't I can't be I can't complain at all. I've I've been plenty of times this season. I'm so happy people are get, going to get to go back, uh, and to everyone as well who's going to be there for the FA Youth Cup final, Dan, because we're going to be there um, alongside, I believe, four and a half thousand other Villa fans, which. It's amazing, man. Honestly, I Fantastic. can't wait to get back down there as a fan and enjoy it as a fan rather than uh, as a journalist. But Dan, as always, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you about the Villa. It's even better when we win. And, uh, yeah. you know, we will be back on Saturday evening, uh, Sunday evening, sorry, Sunday evening, uh, to discuss Villa's performance against Chelsea. So if you enjoyed this podcast, Hit the like, comment your thoughts below on your man of the match. Who scored says it's Bertrand Traore? In fairness, I can see that. So let us know if you agree or if you think differently. Let us know in the comments. And also, if you've not subscribed, please do so. I think we're like one off 4.1K now, which is a joke. One. So, I mean, one of you can subscribe. That would be uh, absolutely amazing for Dan and I. So, yeah, as I said, like, comment, subscribe. And up the bit off.